is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Cradle Book Eight, Winter Steel, chapters fourteen and fifteen. In these chapters, we get to see Mercy go up against Sophara. <sighs> Mercy loses. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Andy for commissioning this episode. I guess. Andy, I'm giving you a dirty look. Listeners, you can't tell, but I swear. I'm giving him a dirty look, I swear. Oh, what a bummer. Honestly, I'm super happy about it. Like, in my heart of hearts, as a, as a person who loves a good plot and a surprise, I love that she lost. Because straight up, that shit was banana pants crazy town. And she didn't lose easily. And this bitch was a fucking overlady. That is no shameful way to lose. And let's be honest... Going into this, I I say all the time how with books that I'm covering and TV shows that I'm covering, that I won't realize I have a preconceived notion of what's going to happen until it doesn't. And then I suddenly realize, oh, I straight up had an expectation. And it was so like understood for me in my mind that I didn't even notice it. You know, and all of a sudden things don't go the way you expect and you feel really adrift. And for me, I would imagine many of you as well. We all sort of thought Lyndon was going to make it to the end, right? Not even necessarily that he'd win the tournament, although I suspect probably many of us thought that. But I just don't think a lot of us expected him to be cut out of the final round. So that right there, I was already like, nice. I did not see that coming. And it's like a bummer because I love Lyndon and I know he's going to take that really hard. But also, it's kind of dope to just undercut what I think is going to happen. And in so many stories like this, when you have a competition that is organized and really meant to display like abilities, your protagonist is going to get to the end and almost always will win. So him being cut out of this, shocker. But Mercy going up against Safara, it's one of those where I guess I had the expectation Mercy was going to win. I don't really know what I thought was going to happen. It's just that what happens if she loses is so like is so bad <laughs> that I didn't really stop to parse through what it would really look like because I was like mm, we're not gonna have to worry about that and I don't know why I thought we weren't gonna have to worry about that so far is willing to put it all on the line here she basically is like and I'll go back and read that section but it feels to me like she has essentially cut herself off from being able to progress to Archlord by progressing to Overlord in with like the damage that she has because she wants to win. And if she gets the attention of the monarchs, that will like heal her channels but her advancement, it feels like, has sort of shaken the foundation of her spirit, if I read that right. Um, a lot of times I'm able to read twice before we start because there's just so much to absorb. But uh, this time I wasn't able to do that. So forgive me if I have that wrong, but we will get there. Um, so let's just start off. We start off in Chapter 14 with Yaren. And Yaren is being kept, like, along with all of the other contestants, she is being kept under essentially lock and key. She has a servant construct. Uh, unsurprisingly, she hates it. 
I mean, Yaren is not the kind of person that you can buy them off uh, with an exchange of like comfort for her basic rights. Not like, for example, myself. Go ahead and make it so that I can't leave. But as long as I have Netflix and a couch and blankets and a mug of hot chocolate, I'm fine with that. And I'm not really going to put up much of a fight over it. I'll just be like, wow, that really sucks. I can't leave. (sighs) Whoa, terrible. And then I just fall asleep. So Yaren and I are not the same. (laughs) Um. And the Winter Sage is keeps telling her that it's for her own security. Uh, and it, it, it's really striking to me. I don't know enough about the Abaddon and the history of the Abaddon's interactions with the monarchs, because we've already established all these monarchs have been offered the chance to ascend to Abaddon, like most of them. And they none of them have taken that offer. And for me, it's baffling. I just don't really get why. We haven't been given enough information to know. The Abaddon are sort of looked at as if they're like this smug, like <laughs> like a country club where they're trying to recruit you and you're just like, oh my God, why are you so obsessed with me? Ugh. And I just feel like if you want power, which they clearly must if they're monarchs, you don't get much more power than being an Abaddon, but you also don't get much more responsibility. And maybe that's part of it is that they do have responsibilities, but they get to completely decide what those responsibilities are. And nobody can really check them. Like, you can, you can do whatever you want. And while ostensibly, you have duties to your people, If you decide not to do that, nobody can do shit about it. And if you're an Abaddon, you have a boss and you're going to be, I would imagine, there's still a hierarchy within the Abaddon from what we've seen, it really seems like. So you wind up being sort of at the bottom of the barrel again. And I guess I sort of see that like, it's, uh, (laughs) it's sort of like when you're a gifted and talented student, and then you get like, accepted at a college that has very high standards. And all of a sudden, you are one of 20,000 gifted and talented students, and nobody cares anymore. And nobody's impressed by you. So maybe that's what it is, is that they're just like, "Mm, yeah, I could definitely go to college and turn back into a nobody. Or I could rule my hometown and be mayor. What do you think? All right, I suppose. But here, what's sort of interesting, Yaren says, show me the face of the killer with so much courage that they'll attack while I'm protected by the heavens. It's not courage we're concerned about, the sage snapped. Who can count on the Abaddon? Wow, that's bold. Who can count on the Abaddon? Why don't you have faith in them? What happened? Who hurt you? I want to know because they have a fucking salty attitude. And this isn't just the sage. Like, everybody has been kind of like fucking Abaddon in this vibe. Like, they let them down. They let Cradle down in a very specific way that everybody's like, seems to remember. And by everybody, I mean, monarchs and sages, like people who have been alive quite a while. I feel like something happened. And they are all just like, fuck those assholes. And I want to know. It's either what I said, something very specific happened, let them down, and they all remember it. Or they are doing that sour grapes thing where they've been invited to become a part of this greater thing and be like, you know, helpful to the universe and all these different iterations. And they have chosen not to do that sort of selfless thing. And they feel shitty about it. So they're trying to make it like the organization is suspect when really, it's just that they're selfish and shitty, and they don't want to admit them to themselves. Who knows? Um, So I guess we'll see. Um, But it it does feel like that it, it might be that second one, because like, what we keep getting whenever we're in Athens POV is a sense that 
Aethon is truly disgusted with a lot of the monarchs and the sages and their attitudes about things. And he seems to really want to help in a, in a real way. And I don't feel like it's out of the question that he would be willing to ascend. But I don't know what that looks like in the face of the monarchs that exist. What I'm saying is the Sage of the Silver Heart, when Lyndon talked to her about how there's only so many people who are allowed to become sages and monarchs in order to keep a balance of power. If Aethon is trying to get to the point where he and his buds, because clearly he's trying to take these folks along with him for the ride, where they all ascend, they're going to have to break through to sage or monarch in order to do that. And who's going to let them? Are they going to be part of the Aurelius family? Does the Aurelius family, they have a sage, right? The sage of the thousand eyes. They don't have a monarch anymore. Am I right? So I guess that they could do that, but they can't have four monarchs. So that doesn't work. Is he planning to what? How do they do it? If that is such a strict rule, and I guess it's not really a rule per se from the way that charity, it's sort of an understood thing that you just don't want to attract too much attention. And yeah, you could like just add another sage to the deck if you wanted to risk everybody turning and looking at your family like, oh, well, we have to deal with you now. Maybe he's hoping, well, we can all uh, ascend a monarch, all of us, and then ascend to Abaddon right after before the other monarchs get a chance to do shit about it. And we're out of the fucking picture, which maybe I don't know how that works. So it's certainly, you know, as far as I know, that's something that's possible. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm curious about it. Oh, Jan... Jan's interesting. Jan says, or no, it's Mordecai. Mordecai says, I feel like if that weapon can take out a dread god, then the Abaddon can take out the dread gods permanently, and I'd be salty about that. Maybe that is what it is. That there's just like, you know, the they they know that there's things that the Abaddon could do to actually intervene. And we know that the Abaddon literally woke up a dread god early on purpose. So maybe they're more aware of the choices the Abaddon make than they, than I think they are. It doesn't seem like they specifically know, of course, exactly what was behind this shift, but they all seem to be aware that this thing wasn't supposed to wake up yet. And they're calling it like a shift in fate. At least Ethan does at one point. So maybe that's part of it. Um, Hmm. And let's see. Ofer says, I feel like the Abaddon are considered as unwelcome rulers slash bureaucrats. They have those rules that none of the monarchs agreed to and monarchs don't like to feel constrained. Um, That's fair. Yeah. I mean, anybody with power, especially like it's so funny when you're at the point of a monarch and there's people that are above you wine, wine, wine. Let me play the tiniest violin. Nobody feels bad for you, monarch. Shut up. And honestly, I'm feeling a way about this discovery that like, oh, yeah, it might be that Malice lost all these like holdings of hers while she was defending against the first Dread God when it hasn't been completely clarified what that means. So for me, I'm still feeling like, you know, oh, somebody cleaned out her bank account while she went and defended lives. And now she's really not sure it's worth it. Uh, I don't know if it's that or not, you know, but I feel like it could be. And now I'm starting to be like, oh, I hope that's not what it sounds like. Um, Mercy, meanwhile, she is like getting hype for this. And by getting hype, I mean, panicking wildly. It's inside. She's not flailing around. She's not running at the mouth. But it's really clear that she isn't peppy and excited and trying to be friendly because all of her attention is being directed to the fact that this match has so much hanging on it. This is just a kind of pressure 
that she rarely feels because she's so gifted. She doesn't come up against people who are a challenge for her most of the time. And even if she did, it would almost always be a fight that doesn't really have genuine stakes, at least to her. And this is the first time that like actual people's well-being rests on how she does in a, in a fight like this. And one of them is her mother. And that's really interesting that like, it's her, she it holds her own mother's life in her hands, sort of. Um, so I feel so bad because Mercy is such a sweetie and to see her get worried and nervous, it's like, just such an unnatural state for her to be in that I really feel it in my guts when it starts happening. And I'm just like, Oh, honey. And you know, she's admirably focused despite all of this. She's really on it. It's not like this is getting under her skin in a way that's affecting her performance, but it's enough to know that she's going to take it really hard that she lost. Like I am not excited about hanging out with her and you know, in her uh, room after this and, and seeing her reaction because I think she gave it her all. She really tried. And I mean, I don't know what's going to happen when the next chapter starts. If it's going to turn out that the way the previous chapter ended wasn't what it looked like and she didn't actually lose. But as of where I'm sitting, it looks like she lost. And this author doesn't do a lot of the like, fake out. A lot of times what it looks like is what it is. Occasionally there's a fake out. I mean, there's the whole like, there's the whole Jai Dai show died. Not really. And I'm not mad at that because he doesn't do it often enough for me to get annoyed. He's not George R.R. Martining it, you know? Um, so I'm going to just go with the fact that she probably did just lose. Um, so Yaren's watching Yan Shomei, who is about to go up against Ethan. And Ethan is being such a fucking bitch. <laughs> I love him so much, you guys. <laughs> I really do. I, I really get why everybody is so irritated with him all the time. And they are correct to be so. But I just love him. And, and I want... To, I, I think everybody deserves... An Ethan moment in their lives where they really get to be so petty and so flagrant about it for ju for just one particular occasion, you know, whether it be you got like abused in a toxic environment at your workplace for 20 years and you finally get to quit and you get to like float out of the office on a cloud of Madra with sparkling robes and uh, blowing on a pipe that's making star shaped clouds. And you're just like, bye bitches on your way out. Everybody should get a moment like this. And the thing is, what's so sa sad about it is that it's all sort of like directed toward Yan Shomei. I don't mean that it's directed at her, there's nobody else involved other than North Strider in the ring. So when he does this, it feels like he's insulting her and she doesn't deserve that. He doesn't think she deserves that. And it's just a side effect of the way he's choosing to handle this whole situation. So he puts up no fight at all in the first fight. She kills him in an instant and it, she's just so like angry because it makes her look bad. She thinks, and I think she's right. The second one, he goes after, she goes after his legs and he has put explosives on his legs so that when she does this in an attempt to force him to fight, which he knows she's going to do, he'll just die. Like he has foreseen how she's going to try and get out of this. And he's like, oh, no, you don't. I am determined to die immediately. Oh, my God. He's so annoying. Um, so, uh, and, and Yaren is watching this and just sort of thinking about, like, I really, like, clearly he got bribed to throw the match. 
everybody seems to be aware of it and sort of accept that this is a thing that would happen. And <laughs> the only question is whether or not he got permission from Malice to throw it before he did it. And that's what Yaren is the most concerned about. She's just like, I really hope that this is sanctioned because otherwise this is going to look really bad. Um, oh my God, this whole thing. Reagan Shen is like in his uh, waiting room, in Ethan's waiting room, and is just watching Ethan reform, cracking up. Ethan's cracking up for the record, not Reagan Shen. Um, Ethan says he wasn't entirely happy about his deal with Malice. He now owed her a favor, paid at a time of her choosing, which was too much of a potential liability for his liking. What if she held on to that token until he advanced to Monarch? But some jokes were worth it. It was at that moment that he realized how cold it was in his waiting room. He had been brought back to life without a stitch of clothing. Oh my god. It's... He's buck-ass naked. And... He's standing there going, all right, so I'm naked. That's kind of uncool of you. I look good. So pfft, joke's on you, kids. And honestly, I bet Ethan's hot as balls. You know, I'm trying to think who I would cast to play Ethan in a movie of these books. I've been thinking a lot about that, like stunt casting. And it's just really annoying because I don't know enough Asian actors by name to be able to do this adequately. I would have to go through uh, IMDb and look up the actual names of people whose faces I recognize. Although to be fair, I can be that way with some white actors as well. I'm not great with names a lot of the time, but uh, I, because I would really want to cast Asian characters in most of these roles, but Ethan is specifically described as being like really fair haired. So he'd probably be played by a white actor. And I don't know who I would choose because I, I feel like I want somebody sort of uh, on the younger side. And I'm old enough at this point in my life where a lot of younger actors, I'm, I'm sort of like, who are you? <laughs> I, I know all the olds, you know? Um, I feel like anybody that is sort of of my era, I picture them younger playing Ethan. But if I chose them now, it would not work, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. Everybody is telling me everybody's that Ethan's white and blonde. I know. I know, guys. I'm, I've read the book. <laughs> um, so yeah, but uh, what I meant about that was just, I would have no idea who I would pick for like Lyndon and Yaren. Um, there was a, an actor that I saw recently that I was like, Oh my God, she would be really good as Renfe. Uh, I miss Renfe. I know that's not on topic. I won't dwell on this, but I keep thinking about her. I don't know why I just liked her and it's just such a bummer how she died. And I just am not really over it. You know? Um, Anyway, okay. So <laughs> we go to Yan Shomei. She asks Ethan if she if he's trying to embarrass her. Uh, I apologize for the lack of respect toward you, but I apologize not at all for the lack of respect toward your master. And she says he is not my master and he should have let me beat you myself. And it's clear that she's getting paid off also. She didn't go into this expecting a real fight. She seems aware she was going into it to win and was told to win. And she's annoyed. And she's walking away and she like reaches out her senses to Ethan and senses that he's an overlord. And she's like, oh, fuck. And there's a moment when she's like, he should have let me beat you himself. And I'm wondering if now she's realizing, oh, I wouldn't have. Like, I definitely would have lost this wasn't going to be like a clean win. Even like if I had wanted it to work out that way, it's not how it would have gone. And this is sort of interesting to me that I really didn't expect Ethan to be a like, I think this is a clever way of handling it because in my mind, Ethan cannot continue competing. He let himself get as far as he did sort of as a favor 
to Yaren because he agreed to go all out and let her and Lyndon see what he could really do. But he didn't want to get this far and, like, draw attention to himself. And getting any further would not be great for his whole plan of, like, letting people think that he is not serious or competent. So he had to find a way out. The author had to give him an out. And this is a really good way to do it, where it's a combination of he's making a deal. So we get to see him orchestrating something, uh, some sort of plan that he's got going on. We get to see him using the bribes to be even more flamboyant and ridiculous, to make himself even more of a joke so that everybody just writes him off. And he gets out of the whole fucking tournament and nobody ever really sees any more of him and what he can do. And he's just sort of forgotten. I mean, it's smart. It works for him, you know? Um, I'm, guys, the comments are loaded with people stunt casting and y'all are picking people who are too old. David Tennant, Nathan Fillion, are you guys serious? Come on. These dudes are like, what, 50 something now? Ethan is supposed to be like, 34? I think he's supposed to be like young for the for an underlord if I remember. Or at least he was young when he became an underlord. Um yeah, y'all are y'all are doing what I said I would do, which is pick people who would have been good in their younger versions of themselves but are nowadays too old. So we got to you got to find the find a a younger a youngie but like I said, I'm not good. Like if you try and I don't even know how old certain actors are because it's just so like twisted and demented how old people in Hollywood look versus how old regular people look. So I have no concept anymore. Um, so I'm I'm going to think on it, though. I'll tell you what, guys. Next episode, which is tomorrow, actually. Just FYI to all of you who aren't aware of this, because you may not have checked the uh, the thingy, the schedule. I had some uh, some episodes that were scheduled for later in the week next week, but it's Christmas week. And I was like, why did I leave that open for booking? So I asked everybody if I could move them to the Saturday before so that I could take all of Christmas week off. And they all were very kind and cooperative. So tomorrow, Saturday at 530 Central Time, there will be another episode. And uh, yeah, you guys just wanted to give you a heads up about that. So Oh my God, Andy just said Michael Caine can play 34. Andy, you're fired. Get out. Um, so yeah, tomorrow or maybe by the time I'm back from Christmas, I will try and have a complete cast list and we'll see what I can come up with here. I will say, um, oh my God, Lucy Lou, I keep picturing for some reason as Charity and I don't really know why. I think it's because she plays sort of a stoic type on elementary, where she kind of keeps her emotions very much in check. And Charity is so like that, that every time I picture like a stone faced, unamused kind of thing, I keep picturing Lucy Lou. So that's the only person. Um, so we go to Zeal. <sighs> you guys. <gasps> zeal broke my heart now look i have no doubt that athan is going to help him out and it's going to be okay but oh my god i was so sad <sighs> y'all i wasn't ready for like how emotional his section was going to be. He, first of all, considers himself worthless. And it's like really deep in his bones belief. It is not, I wouldn't like, it, it doesn't feel like getting healed would change that belief in him as much as I think he seems to think it would. It's like, the fact that he allowed this to happen to him at all sealed it. The fact that he was able to be injured in this way 
that's the period at the end of the sentence. And he really can't like see past that. And I hated this. The first fight, he doesn't even really try. He puts forth a minor effort and he gets wrong footed and doesn't recover and gets fucking slapped around. And it's a moment of that's really interesting where he realizes once he's back in his waiting room, oh, I do have a tiny bit of pride left. I thought I didn't care, but now that I've lost, I am really pissed. And I really do kind of want to try now. So he gathers himself up, psychs himself up, fucking in the mirror a little bit, but like in his head. And he walks out with this new vibe and North Strider can sense it and is like, ooh, all right, welcome to the tournament, finally. And he goes into this and really goes to town. And he's feeling like maybe he's back. And there's this moment, you guys, he is about to win. He is so close. He raised his hammer, forging a circle around it. The green runes fuzzed to essence before they were half complete and the hammer fell from his numb fingers. He stared at it for a long moment, uncomprehending, but then the stone anchor enforcer technique dropped. His shield was too heavy for him, tugging him off balance as he tried to keep it upright with his whole body weight. His spirit had failed him. No matter how much he endured the pain, his soul was still shattered. Determination alone didn't let you run on two broken legs. He should never have forgotten who he was. Oh, you guys, I swear to God, that was so awful. And this is the kind of thing that, in some ways, I understand what he means. It's really frustrating when people try and behave as if just being determined is enough to get you through anything because... It's just such a lie. And it's something that we tell ourselves to give ourselves the illusion that we have control over everything. We have control over a few things. We have control over our reactions to things sometimes. But a lot of people really want to believe we are able to control a whole lot more than we are, because that makes them feel better. And it also makes them feel superior to other people whose lives aren't going super well, because they think, well, my life is going pretty well, and theirs isn't, which must mean I'm better at life than them. And maybe you are. But are you? And how long will that last? You know, like, we all have our shit. And he gets so close. And the crowd is cheering for him. He remembered this feeling. Life crept back into him as he hadn't felt in years. The exhilaration didn't cancel out the pain, but it made the agony more bearable. It's just when you get that close and you still fail, despite really thinking you had it this time, picking yourself back up after something like that is especially hard. I think it's it's really overlooked sometimes how much easier it is to keep pushing yourself when you're kind of nowhere near your goal and it still feels like this distant accomplishment but when it's something that you feel like you just let slip through your fingers just now it's there's something about that that makes it seem so much more impossible because you just almost you know um i just hated it So everybody is talking about Jason Momoa as either North Strider or Fury. Uh, I could see, I I don't see him as North Strider. He's way too, like, he's too much of a fucking bro. Fury works. I see that because Fury is just so like, he just is wild in this way where he's just always looking for a fight. And that feels like kind of a Momoa thing. I could see that. Um, man I'm just uh, so he runs into Ethan and Ethan is basically like hey what if I could cure you and I wanted you to work for me for a year in exchange and he kind of makes it seem like he already has the stuff that will cure him it's this uh, I'm trying to find the here it is um, the pure storm baptism 
Thanks to some fortuitous circumstances and a few carefully laid plans, I happened to find myself in possession of both. Uh, Mordecai says, Momoa looking for a fight. He lives on a beach under a tree. He's an actor. I don't know if you know this, but how he lives as a person has nothing to do with it. I'm sorry, everybody who's listening. I'm being distracted by the chat, and that's not what you're here for. Apologies. I'm just saying he absolutely is not North Strider to me in any sense, but whatever. So Zeal calls Ethan out right here and is just like, yeah, you don't have it. You're lying. And Ethan's like, "Mm, lie is a strong word. I could have it. How about that? And... He says that he has a private garden being prepared for the materials. Uh, he's getting a refiner. I And the skill to perform the procedure, I give great massages too. And lightning madra of sufficient power. Um, without Tiberian Aurelius, that leaves you scales from the Thunder Fairy, the Storm Sage, or the Weeping Dragon itself. Athan's smile was painfully bright. Which would you prefer? And Zeal, he tries to write Ethan off here because it's just, he doesn't want to get his hopes up again. Zeal's exhausted, but he can't help but get his hopes up again. It's just, he can't help it. And he puts the fucking little, he he basically, Ethan puts his number into Zeal's phone and Zeal looks at it and is about to press delete and is then like, okay, fine, and saves it. And he's just like, yeah, okay, I'll just keep it just like in case. So then we go to chapter 15. Uh, (laughs) Mordecai says he's not a great actor. I love him, but I know the limitations. Then why does he play a fighter in literally every role? He's always the guy who fights. Are you serious? That's like his whole thing. He's the big man who fights in everything he's in. Um, Is Fury described as big? I can't remember what he's like physically looks like um so (laughs) i love fury telling mercy loosen up you'll be fine we know all their tricks just go kill her you know what good advice so he mercy goes into this and she has a couple of like tricks up her sleeve that that they are all being saved for each fight because it seems like she sort of anticipates that they're going to go to three because it's the best two out of three, which I don't feel like I've addressed enough how much I like that. It's just, I, I really enjoy the concept of getting to go up against an opponent more than once and adjust the way that you've approached the fight. And I like the concept of them knowing that you're going to adjust and so continuing to hold back so that they can still surprise you with a whole other thing. And I'm really curious because like Lyndon and Yaren did kind of go all out. And I would like to know what each of them would have been able to bring to a fight that would surprise someone. And we haven't seen Yaren's fight yet. If I'm not like we don't that doesn't happen. This is all mercy here. Um, So. I'm really curious, like, how would they would be if it's just being better at a technique that they weren't super great at before, or if they'd be able to pull something totally new out. We might see something totally new from Yaren. I don't know. Um, Because, like, really, the amount of time that they spent with their sages, it's passed quite quickly, and we haven't seen all of her training. So there could be all kinds of stuff we aren't aware she can do. Um, So Malice uh, is in her waiting room. And notices that Mercy isn't really that excited. And she has just a a whole different motivation. She's like, "Uh, everybody's lives are in your hands. Isn't that a rush? And Mercy's like, "Mm, no, that's just not a thing that like, you know, juice is my fruit. I don't know. And finally, her mom is like, how about being able to completely let loose against an opponent that can actually withstand it. Won't that be fun? And that's when Mercy's like, Ooh, okay. Yeah, no, that's actually pretty good. You're right. Cause like she has gone up against everybody and it always just has felt like 
you know, I mean, even with Harmony, he wanted to marry her. And then when she beat him, he basically broke the engagement off and ran off pouting. Like, it must be nice to just really know you can go for it here. Um, Safara touched the guardian's helmet and wished her sister goodbye. They had covered Akeri's remnant in plates of golden armor so that her serpentine dragon form was more beautiful than ever, and had planned to use her as a guardian of her homeland. Instead, Safara kept her sister's remnant in her own void key. The storage was now filled with beneficial natural treasures to create an aura-rich environment, and Safara fed Akeri scales whenever possible. Honestly, you guys, I won't lie, this was a tiny bit touching. She's got her sister's, like, ghost in a place that she can ex access it and be like, hey, girl, what's up? And try and, like, get her a little bit juiced up and continue maybe growing more and more sentient. And it was, like, super sad to me. And I felt, I don't know, it just was unexpected. It was very tender. And I just was sort of, mm, I just felt sad over it. Um, and this is when she says that her spirit was cracked, but hadn't gotten worse. The longer she remained at Underlord stage, the better. And I was like, oh, so that's not going to happen. Like that being purposely mentioned, I was like, yeah, I don't think... Um, she could advance whenever she wished, but even if she ended up stuck as an overlady, it would be worthwhile if she could eliminate the Akura family heir, which uh, I hope it was, because you are going to be stuck, I suspect, unless you do get the attention you need to fix yourself, which you know what? She probably will. Like, is she's, is she, is she, I don't know. The, the broken Madra channels, though, it seemed like that had to be fixed before she advanced. And that was sort of the thing. So I don't know. Maybe she can't be. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's up his sleeve. I don't trust myself to make that kind of prediction because I feel like he could just be like, yeah, I'm going to do what I want. Um, so at this point, the king shows up and she's really was not expecting him and he has been so hard on her. I mean, we saw the way that he was like, you fucked up and you better not fuck up again. And this time he's like, hey, what's up? Look, you don't win this one. No hard feelings. The fact that you got me here. I'm pretty proud of you. And I'm not mad about it if you lose because low key mercy's pretty fucking tough. And I just want you to like put up a good fight and make her work for it. I won't be upset if you lose, just saying. And she's like, wow, okay. Because it's clear that she really thought he was going to come in here and be like, if you don't win, don't come home, you know? Um, so they have their first fight. And she falls into a trap that Mercy sets on purpose she knows she's big and strong. She has a body that has been, you know, like we were told earlier um, by Orthos, I think, when he's talking to Lyndon about eating like the, the meat of sacred beasts, that all the dragons are fed this stuff from when they're a hatchling. And so they are really strong and have essentially perfect bodies, like in terms of their overall uh, efficiency with energy and strength and all of that. So she basically is coming in here with a huge advantage in that regard and doesn't think that Mercy can have discovered a compensating equivalent to fight back against that kind of direct strength. And she's wrong. <laughs> um, so she allows herself to be sort of like lured in closer than she should because she's planning on just basically smashing Mercy and unexpectedly Mercy is able to reach up and stop the strike in and it's a really like a, one of the few moments of seeing Safara genuinely startled um Mercy didn't have time to see the shock on her face but she felt it in the hesitation of the other woman's spirit 
The Akura bloodline armor was notoriously difficult to control. When summoned over the entire body, it made the user clumsy and slow. On the other hand, Mercy's puppeteer's iron body gave her perfect control over her movements, and the Dark Tide incantation flowed with the flexibility of water and shadow. Mercy punched Safara in the gut, launching her backwards, but snagged her with a quick string of shadow before her body could fly too far. Mercy whirled Sue into a staff strike. <laughs> Honestly, there is something so insulting about somebody punching you, but like holding you in place so that you don't fly away too completely out of their reach. It's just like, it's just insult to injury that they're not only able to punch you, but have the foresight to know that punch is going to be so hard that you might get too far away and they can't have that. Yikes. <laughs> um, so she wins and Safara wakes up in her waiting room and is like, holy fucking balls. What was that? And is really upset. And she's like, all right, you know what? Fuck this mess. And she just reaches into her void key and pulls out all her shit and sits down and ascends. She just does it. She's like, I am not fucking around anymore. And she becomes much more human looking. I really would love to see this. Um, but yeah, she is going into the next fight as an overlady. And Mercy doesn't seem particularly concerned about it. And I think that's something that Safara, like, that rattles her. She thinks, oh, I'm going to come into this. I'm going to clearly be an overlady. I'm not going to veil myself. So she definitely knows what I am. And that's going to fuck up her whole head. And Mercy's like, mm, eh. I was honestly also kind of surprised by that. Maybe she just knew that was likely. And, and, and the fact that Mercy can open her book and kind of get an overlady power might be part of it. But it's like, that doesn't last long enough to explain that sort of complacency. Complacency is probably the wrong word, but you know. Um, so, they go head to head again and Mercy is doing a lot of arrow stuff. And there's an interesting thing where she's weaving all of these different techniques together into one arrow. And it's so frustrating because she keeps being thrown when she's trying to aim. And eventually she has to release, release the technique and just get rid of the arrow because she can't hold any further. And, it doesn't do anything. Um, and all of a sudden she, cause she really is like thinking that she probably has beaten mercy cause she tosses her or something. And all of a sudden she senses an overlord spirit in the ring with her. And she turns to see mercy kneeling on the side of the crater uh, that she had landed in. The human's hair had torn loose, hanging into her face, and she wiped blood from her lip with the back of her hand. The gesture shook Sofara with fear. Mercy was a devil, a ghost, a spirit of terror. She had come to track Sofara down, to torment her, to torture her with nightmares. Quickly, pretty quickly, Sofara is able to push back against this and recognize this for what it is, that it's a type of like dream aura that causes fear, but it does shake her for a minute. Um, and she, because like, she knows that this exists, but she didn't know that mercy could do it. Uh, and she didn't know that mercy could ad temporarily advance to overlord levels either. She had thought that that was like, you know, she'd done it to, get to high gold, I think, or was it true gold when she was low gold? But this kind of thing she hadn't been aware was even possible. Um, so she and Mercy hit one another, her with uh, the golden like dragon flame and Mercy with an arrow. And she 
Let's see. B-b-b-b-b. Her madra began to leave her control, but Mercy was even worse condition. She was blackened and pitted red. Her eye mangled and her ear melted. She fell to the ground and curled up with an agonizing scream. Safara didn't have time to gloat or enjoy the sight. She used her last trickle of madra to extend Quick River, whipping it up into the side of Mercy's head. An instant later, Mercy disappeared. And I was like, ooh, damn. We go to Mercy. She has appeared in her waiting room. And I really appreciate that the author bothers to talk about the mental trauma of getting certain injuries and the fact that Charity was able to help Mercy with the trauma from the time that she was burned and that North Strider has apparently built in ways to heal that as well to as healing people's bodies. You know, the the whole thing about the way the tournament works is that you're not actually being hurt. You're not actually being killed. So he's able to make sure that is true of your mental space as well, because that can also suffer damage, you know, and that's a very real thing. And I thought that that was kind of cool to like mention that specifically. I liked that. Um, Safara could outlast Mercy in any prolonged contest. Mercy's armor would only last so long, as would her temporary advancement to Overlord. Charity and Mercy had both suspected that Safara would begin the first fight by leaning on her superior power. Uh, their entire strategy for the second fight had been to surprise Safara with the Dream of Darkness technique. Mercy had only one more card to play, and the final duel was the time to go all out. There was no sense holding anything back now. Of course, Safara had more to show as well. Azure Moon Reigns had been completed, but like any persistent ruler technique, it showed its true power the longer it was allowed to remain. Well, she winds up doing a whole thing with the sun as well, which is a deal with like fire aura. We'll get there. Um, And she has this moment with Charity where it's very clear that Charity is like not sure of herself or this situation in a way that she doesn't often reveal to people, but she's acting like sort of distracted and jumpy and Mercy's like, "Mm, yeah. And she tries to put on an air of confidence and says, leave it to me. Um, So they start the, uh, the fight again and Mercy limbers up eclipse ancient bow of the soul seeker. So, she forges an arrow onto the string, releases it, and, like, how many arrows? Uh, but, but, but I'm trying to find exactly how this goes. Um, but it, 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 it multiplies the arrows to a point that I really thought that was going to be it. But no, Safara manages to survive this as well. Um, she was juggling 20 knives at once. This is from Mercy's POV. When she sensed the power fading from Safara's mind, she dropped everything she was juggling except one. Quick River shredded her right arm and gold dragon's breath had already ruined her left. Mercy fell backwards, twisting in the air to hold her bow with her right foot and pull the string back with her teeth. The arrow was a plain, unadorned string of shadow, and as she watched her aim through the moon's eye, she knew Safara's scripted golden shield would block the shot. Mercy's spirit strained past its limits, her channels screamed in pain, and her core dimmed to almost nothing, as she activated the technique in her bow. Arrows of violet light formed in the air all around the weapon, dozens and then hundreds forged in a blink. Their color matched the blazing eyes of the dragon's head at Eclipse's center, which was currently glaring at Sofara. Mercy released her black arrow, and 200 violet arrows followed as the Archlord Forger technique launched at the same time. The Imperial Aegis intercepted one attack, but only one. The arrows exploded into violet lights as they landed. Even her moon's eye couldn't pick out the dragon from the chaos. The barrage slowed, but the match hadn't ended. Safara was still alive. That sentence, Safara was still alive. That's when I knew Mercy was going to lose. 
And I was bummed out, you guys. I was still holding on some hope, but really that was the moment where I was like, oh, if that didn't do for this bitch, I'm sorry, girl, but you have no arms. Your arms are off. What are you going to do? Bleed on her? Um, so she keeps trying. She's not letting it go. You know, she keeps in mind this woman's trying to kill her mother. She's keeping in mind, yeah, I don't have arms, but I got other shit I could do. And Safara, like, to be fair, is in really bad shape. She may not be dead, but she's fucked up. Uh, her hair had been seared off, as had most of her clothes and huge patches of her skin. A sacred artist's clothes were not often destroyed in battle. Not only were they made of sturdy materials, but a person's inherent spiritual protection extended to their clothes as well. Sleeves and hems were often damaged, but you usually only saw completely ravaged clothing on corpses. Her left arm was a withered, bloody mess that looked like it had been torn apart by wolves and blood spread across her middle. Even a chunk of her jaw was missing. But she gripped Quick River in her less mangled hand, and the liquid metal blade began to glow orange. Oh, no. She activates the binding in her weapon. Uh, hate it. And Mercy tries to conjure her armor, and she slips. <sighs> She couldn't afford to push away the subtle ruler technique of the azure moon and crimson sun anymore. Water aura had gathered around her foot and knocked her off balance. Her other leg gave out as she landed on it, and a fiery blade passed through her neck. I hate it. Mmm. Mmm. Guys, Mercy was really the only person, other than maybe Yaren, who could have been any sort of match for Safara. And Yaren was not confident. She really pretty much said, I am not a match, actually, when Lyndon asked her about it. Now, granted, she's gotten some training since then, so perhaps now she is. But... Whether or not Safara wins this whole tournament, and it really looks like she could now, the fact that she beat the genius of the Akura clan, uh, that's not great. Not what we wanted. I really wonder if we're going to get to the end of this tournament, because it feels like shit's about to really hit the fan. And I would not be surprised if something happens that causes this whole thing to basically be abandoned. I don't know what would what that would look like. But, you know, this is sort of it, it is it feels like this is the moment where things really ratchet up. And I don't see getting to the end of this tournament and there being like a whole like celebration with a winner that's too organized and shit's really going left with the whole thing with the dread god i don't know i don't i just wonder if that's even gonna be something to worry about anymore this might be the thing that like the, I, I don't doubt that there's going to be a couple more fights but i feel like this is the turning point where whether or not we continue with this tournament goes much more up in the air. Um, so yeah, I'm just really curious and I get to find out tomorrow. I'm so excited. I just get to read it right away. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just, oh, guys, I'm really excited though. Like I said, the fact that mercy loses is pretty interesting. You want your guy to win really a lot of the time, but you do want something new also. It's part of why I loved like the movie Friday Night Lights. The fact that your team loses in the end. Spoilers for Friday Night Lights, the movie. That was what made me love that movie. They try their best and they really work hard and they still lose. And I don't know why, but that really like got to me and I loved 
the whole message of just kind of being like, yeah, sometimes you do your best and you don't win anyway. And that doesn't mean that you suck. It just, that's life, you know? Um, so, hmm. I, I just don't know what to expect now. Safara is going to be fucking lit. She's going to be so happy. And her master, I mean, he's going to just do fucking cartwheels. He'll, he must be. Yeah. Anyway. All right. I'm going to wrap up. I can't believe I'm on time. Um, thank you again, everybody in the chat for hanging out. Uh, except for you, Mordecai, you're wrong about Jason Momoa and I will die on this hill. It's fine. And thank you very much to Andy for commissioning this episode. I appreciate you. Uh, Andy reached out to me and was like, hey, if you have COVID, you really don't have to record. I appreciate it. Um, but I'm good. I think I think we're out of danger now. So um, and I will be seeing you all again tomorrow with a new episode. So hope hope that I get to see you all there. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>